Welcome to the Veterans Archives podcast, where every veteran's story is honored and celebrated. Join us as we delve into the rich histories and experiences of those who have served our nation. You can catch our podcast on all major podcast platforms, as well as every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Reads Across America Radio. At Veterans Archives, we believe your story matters. Visit our website at www.veteransarchives.org to explore more about our mission, discover resources for veterans, and stay updated on upcoming episodes. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn to engage with our community. Subscribe, like, and share to spread awareness about our veteran stories. Whether you're a veteran, a supporter, or simply curious about the profound journeys of those who have served, Veterans Archives invites you to listen in, learn, and be inspired. Join us as we continue to honor and preserve the legacies of our veterans. Today is Thursday, July 18th, 2024. Our guest is Brian Daniels, who served in the United States Army. So, Brian... We're going to start out super simple. Okay. When and where were you born? I was born in Lansing, Michigan. All right. Uh, April 18th, 1986. It was a Friday. Yeah. Three years after I graduated high school. (laughs) I'm young or you're old or both. Yeah. Yeah. A combination of both, I think. They're not mutually exclusive. (laughs) So let's talk a little bit about some of your first memories. What was it like growing up Brian Daniels? Um, Chaotic, I would say. Yeah. My, okay. So my earliest memory is, uh, honestly, my father was, uh, he was pretty abusive, um, to my mother and my siblings and myself. And my, my first memory is, um, I, I was in kindergarten. I was afraid of the dark and, um, I crawled in bed with my mom and my dad came home from working third shift and he took me out and threw me in the dumpster. Um, because boys aren't afraid of the dark. And so I crawled out of the dumpster. I like woke up and uh, as I crawled out, my mom saw me and that's when she left my dad. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about your mom and dad a little yeah. bit. Um, uh, this Jumping is, right into it. Yeah. Let's just a un- hard question. Let's unpack that. Good luck. Um, yeah. So um, tell me about your, tell me about your dad other than he threw you in a dumpster. Uh, what did he do and, and what was he like? And was yeah. he throwing people in a dumpster all the time or was there times where he wasn't throwing people in a dumpster? You know, you know what? So, um, I, I always try to qualify telling that story with like my father is a very different person now. Um, back then he drank a lot. Uh, he, he grew up, you know, in a classically abusive household. And so he was just repeating patterns. Um, he was the first black vice president of the UAW. Uh, 1753. He worked at general motors at the, uh, parts plant in Lansing. Um, And retired from there. So he was a GM guy through and through. So I grew up the same way. Yeah. Blue collar family. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what about your mom? Um, So my mother was a school teacher. uh, And then she realized she doesn't like kids. (laughs) But she had six of us. So she said it was a lack of luck with birth control. So. Yeah. That's funny. So my my daughter is a school teacher. Mm Mm-hmm. And she doesn't, she doesn't have any children because she doesn't like children, but she loves the kids that she teaches. That makes sense. They go home. Yeah. 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 They're the best kind. I exactly. Think so my mom, uh, she was a school teacher until I think my older sister was born. And then she was a stay at home mom. Um, when she left my father, she worked at Meyer and stuff, but we'll get into it later, but there's plenty of other drama. She ended up not working for a long time. So I see. So I'm going to ask you kind of a tough question here. You too. can ask me anything you want. Uh, you know, I, I, I think our parents are never the same people they were when we were growing up because we could tell stories, right? Yeah. So tell me one thing that you remember about your father when you were a kid that's a good memory. Well, my father was uh, a semi-pro ping pong player. So we would go, it would always be all these uh, small Asian guys and then my big big black six, three foot dad (laughs) on on a ping pong table. So that was always something that I always really enjoyed. Um, And he was, uh, I mean, he was a lot of fun. He was like a big kid. Yeah. Yeah. When it was fun, it was fun. And exactly. When it wasn't, it wasn't exactly. So what about your mom? Like what's a, what's a great early memory of your mom? Oh, um, so I, I'm the fourth of six kids. And so, um, I always try to just stay out of the way. My mom and I have a special relationship. I've always been a mama's boy. Um, so for me, it was like, you know, laying in my mom's lap and just, I used to have long curly hair, um, until sixth grade, but, uh, so it's just laying in my mom's lap and just getting like that, that 
little bit of peace I had was, is my favorite memory. Honestly, um, she was so busy with the rest of them. I just try to stay out of the way. So fourth out of six kids, does that, did, do you think that puts you in like that middle child? Syndrome? Oh, I have middle child syndrome, hardcore for okay. sure. Yeah. All right. It kind of sounded that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. No, um, I've, I've, I've learned to own it and understand it. Um, my, um, my older siblings though, the age range is pretty vast. My mom had her first kid at, um, I believe 19 and then she had her last kid at 41. And so the age range is so vast. My older brother was, you know, grown and out of the house when I was coming up. So, okay. Well, and, and this is a great segue, right? I want to learn a little bit about your siblings. So let's just work through the, the birth order there, the, oh, the first to the last. And we don't have to spend 10 hours on it, but I want to get a feel for, you know, no, who your family no was. No problem. Um, so uh, I always say that we're a textbook case of dysfunction. Um, my older brother Jonathan, he joined the mili- uh, He joined the Navy um, out of high school. He was on a nuclear submarine, um, developed schizophrenia, beat up his commanding officer, got kicked out of the military, and has been uh, kind of a recluse since. Mm-hmm. You know, my mother is very close with him, but really, just my mother is close with him. Uh, he's just not good at social interaction. hasn't taken care of himself. Um, my two older brothers, they have a different father than I do. And their father went to prison for raping boys. So I think like, you know, when we step back and we look at them, we're like, okay, this all makes sense now. Um, but at the time it was just chaos. Right. Um, so Jonathan, that's Jonathan. Jeremy um, uh, is, uh, he works at Meyer. He works at uh, Meyer Warehouse. He was one of the first gay marriages in Ingham County when it was legalized. Um, and I think that they have the longest marriage of anybody in my family at this point. Um, and Jeremy is, uh, we're not close at all. Again, the age range is just too vast. Right. Um, and then, um, I mean, how, how real do you want me to get right now? Cause I'll tell you anything you want to know, but. Well, I mean, we, we can get as real as we need to be understanding that other people will listen to this. So if there's things that you don't really want other people to, to know that's fine. Yeah. Um, but to get to know who you are, it's kind of important to know, know yeah, certain I things. I so, mean, so, you know, there's a, there's, um, there's a lot of, in this, of the six kids, the, the older three talk more and thus younger three talk more. Okay. Um, Jeremy, um, this is my second brother. He, he, um, he's not involved a lot with the younger three of us. So, um, you know, I see him at holidays or funerals, but that's really about it. Um, and then my older sister, Robin, um, I would say had the hardest dealt hand that I've known as a person. Um, we, um, when she was, I believe 15 years old, um, at an apartment complex, we were living in an apartment complex in Okemos and the maintenance man sexually, uh, molested her and he ended up going to prison, but it created a lot of mental health struggles that my sister's never really been able to recover from. And, um, because of those struggles, we were, uh, we, we were, we had a lot of instability and eventually ended up homeless. And that's actually how we came to live at the VFW national home. So, okay. All right. So, I mean, it's listen to the first three, things were pretty rough. Let's, uh, so, then you were born? Yes. Is that how so that works? I was the only, and I'll repeat that, the only planned birth my mother had. So, I so you hold to, a special place I, in her heart. I try to hold that over my siblings as yes. well. Um, yes. I mean, most of the time I would just tell my siblings that they were adopted, but you can go, hey, I was the only planned one. I was the one. only planned one. Nice. Uh, my father wanted a son. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I was born uh, in 86, and I'm. I really feel lucky as a millennial to have got to have a childhood that had very minimal video game and computer exposure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, in my teenage years, PlayStation was getting bigger and I got to actually like get into that, but I still had what I think was like a classic American childhood. Okay. Yeah. Which is not necessarily a, a, a bad thing. No, no. So then you have, so who's the next one on the so list? So then Kelly, um, who I, I think is the most talented of us. Uh-huh. Uh, she could play any instrument, uh, she can sing and act. She's just great. She uh, So she's living now in Grand Rapids. She has a few kids, and 
she's helping take care of my father who has some pretty advanced dementia now. So, uh, you know, Kelly is, Kelly has been a rock for us through all of the stuff with my father's health, but, and then the youngest is Andrea. Uh, she is a school teacher in Kalamazoo and her husband is an assistant coach for an ECHL team in Calgary. So he just got that job. He was the captain of the Kalamazoo K wings and then was the special teams coach. And now, and now he's in the ECHL. So it's pretty cool. Wow. That is pretty, that is pretty cool. Now I got to ask though, with the youngest, does she, does she like exemplify the youngest child? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, her life was completely different. Her childhood wasn't nearly as unstable. She, she went to grand ledge elementary, middle and high school. Her, her whole experience was so different. Um, but she's the funniest of us right. by far. She has a very great dry wit. Well, that's good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's good. So let's talk about uh, a little bit about what you kind of alluded to. Um, you know, you, there's six kids. Mm-hmm. And um, so at the time that you became homeless, yes. so what what was the cause of your homelessness? So so my mother, you know, my mother had left my father. My older brothers were gone by then. And so there's four of us. Robin, who's struggling with her mental health issues, she became anorexic and then bulimic. And the lack of fat in her brain caused uh, schizophrenia. So then she was in my uh, Pine Rest Mental Institution. And my mother had to miss so much work, she ended up getting fired. And so we had nowhere to go and no money to get there. What was that like? Uh, And how old were you? I was in fifth grade. Okay. I was in fifth grade uh, going into sixth. It was, I was in the middle of fifth grade. It was really confusing. Um, You know, when you don't, come from money, it's, you get used to it after a while. Right. But also I like, I, I had just, I credit my mom so much. She, she never let us feel like we were really going without how she pulled that off. I'll never know. But, um, Christmas Eve of 1996. Um, yeah. Yeah. Christmas Eve of 96, my mom had to pawn what jewelry she had left and she got us a hotel room and then she went out and she bought Christmas presents and we woke up to a hotel room, like in a roach motel full of Christmas presents. And it was like that, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff really stuck with me. She's always figured out a way to make it work. And, uh, I'm happy that she's like happily retired and and just enjoying her days as a pothead hippie. (laughs) Well, good, uh, good for her. And, yeah. and I, you know, I can't even imagine what it's like to be that young and not have a home to go to. How long were you homeless? Uh, you know, it's a great question. Uh, uh, a long time. It must've seemed like it. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a couple of months of us like staying in a van or crashing on people's couches and stuff until we ended up moving to the national home. Okay. And, and, and let's just kind of go right into that. So yeah. you came to live at the VFW National Home um, a while ago. It's where you work now, but we're going to get into that yeah, in just later. a moment. Uh, so what was it like coming here? I know what it's like coming here every day to work, but what's it like coming to the National Home as a kid? You've been living in a van. You've been couch yeah. surfing. I mean, I felt like I felt like we'd won the lottery. I From that perspective, I... I mean, I'd lived in Lansing my whole life. So moving out to the country was, was a big culture shock for me. Um, being one of the only black kids in Eaton Rapids was a big culture shock for me, but to all of a sudden have my own bedroom and, you know, getting paid allowance to do minor chores and having 400 acres to go play on. It was, it was amazing. And food on your and table. Food, yes. Yeah. So you said it was a culture shock for you coming here. I, how do you think that culture shock was for your peers in a small town school who probably many of them now, I know from my experience in the military, there are a lot of people, this really surprises me because I grew up in Lansing too. Yeah. There are people who've never even seen a black person. Yeah. Right. And I got to assume that maybe you ran into that when you were out here. You know, I think what, what surprised people most is, you know, so I'm mixed and my father being the first black vice president of 1753, he, he was really good at assimilating, right? So he didn't he didn't sound quote unquote black. There was no ebonics. There was no um the like slang was frowned upon in my household. And so um I come from, you know, a black family that moved up from the south to for General Motors and 
worked at Buick and they lived in an upper class neighborhood and they were the first black family on that street. So, um, I didn't sound or act how people thought I would. And I think that at first I was put into a box that I didn't fit in and they didn't know how to deal with that. Um, and then everyone realized that I really sounded and act like them and I love hockey. And, um, it wasn't until I start trying to, you know, date girls that my race becomes an issue. Right. Yeah. Right. That, there are times when that, that mm-hmm. can be a problem. I mean, that Absolutely. We, gotta, we have to be honest about that. Yep. Um, you know, it's interesting you say that, uh, I have a friend who, um, I won't mention his name, but he, um, had an interaction with someone one time and he had talked to them on the phone. He said, well, I'll be over in a minute to help you out with this thing. And he shows up at the house. This guy's never met before. He shows up and knocks on the door. The guy answers the door and goes, Oh, you didn't sound black on the phone. Yeah, what does that even mean? Yeah, what the hell's black on the phone? I have no idea. Right? So mm-hmm. when I hear someone say, I didn't sound black or you don't mm-hmm. sound black, that that doesn't resonate with me because we all have our own way of speaking and doing the things that mm-hmm. we do. But it sounds like you made friends out here. Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, at least, you know, during my time here, it was no, you know, it was no secret that the VFW kids were poor, right? So. Right. I think you're automatically put in back then, at least you were put into different categories in school and you had different friends. But, um, I had a couple of really good friends here who, um, I've, I've kept in touch with a bit, but there are a couple of people who lived here with me that I'm friends with till, uh, you know, still. And, uh, for me, the living at the national home, you never felt poor, um, you know, I think that this place gives an opportunity to children that most people would dream of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, when I come here every day and drive through those gates, it's like going back in time. I know it, it really, really is. is and in a good way. Yeah. I always tell people on tours, it's the last place in America you can ride your bike safely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, you can tell when the street lights come on too. Mm-hmm. That's when you go home. Well, you were here for a couple of years. Yeah. Kind of walk me through like a day in the life of a kid here at the VFW national home. Um, and what was that like for you? Well, you know, for me, um, uh, we have to, we have to rewind and accept that I was here in a different, you know, different era, different leadership. Um, the programs here were different. They used to have a residential program with, um, it was basically like a, an orphanage. And so, um, when I lived here, you had natural kids like me, and then you had res kids and the res kids were privy to more opportunities, more activities. Um, and so we were always, uh, we knew as natural kids that because we had our, one of our parents with us, that we, there were things that we weren't going to get to do. Um, that being said, you know, I was still out every day riding my bike, playing in the community center. Um, I won my first ping pong tournament there. Uh, going out to the pond and fishing. It would just do everything I could all day long until, like you said, the streetlights came on and then I would just have to be in my yard. Right. Yeah. And uh, so you you were here um, for a few years, uh, getting your mom, getting her feet back underneath her, all of those things. Uh, so what happened? Why did you transition out and, and what was that like for you? So during Michigan Day, 1999, my would be stepfather was the post commander of the Charlotte post. And he was dressed up as a clown and making balloon animals. And he hit on my mom and less than three months later, they were married and yeah. And so we ended up moving to grand ledge cause that's where Tom Kirby lived. And that's where I ended up graduating high school. <laughs> he must be a heck of a guy because I, th- I, I, I think like if I'm in a clown outfit, and, and I've got the, the chutzpah, for lack of a better way to say it, to, to make it known that I like somebody and they like me back, even though I'm wearing this clown costume, man, that's something. Hey, my mom is weird. No, <laughs> but uh, I mean, Tom, Tom was charming. My mom and Tom, their chemistry was instant and it was really intense. Uh, unfortunately, as a teenager, you have to hear these things in the house. It was awful. Oh, I know. But, but like they were really, they really did love one another. And Tom was a Vietnam vet. Uh, who had his own issues. A lot of Vietnam vets did, you know, so we, we weren't really that close until after I came home from Iraq. Okay. And now you moved to um, Grand Ledge. What, what grade would you have been in? I, I, yeah, I was, I was in Eaton Rapids in sixth, seventh and eighth. So I went, yeah. So I moved in eighth grade to Grand Ledge 
Okay. And then finished high school in Grand Ledge. So you got the, uh, that's almost a privilege these days, right? Absolutely. Especially if you're living a chaotic childhood, um, to be able to have that much time in one school and be able to graduate. Yeah, I went to four elementary schools, yeah. you know, so yeah. it was being able to stay there. That's why I always say I'm from Grand Ledge because that's where I spent a majority or the most like stable time. Uh-huh. And then, uh, so when did you graduate? Graduated in 2004. Okay. And what was, so what was junior high and high school like for you? Um, I was every pretty girl's best friend, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, being the fourth of six, being shy, I wasn't um, strong and athletic, so I was just friends with everybody. Um, I was what I always called myself a floater. I didn't really have a group. I had a couple of really close friends that I'm still close with, and um, for me, I, I had ADHD, but my mom didn't believe in medication, so my grades were not great, um, but my teachers always loved me, and my participation was always great. So for me, it was always a battle to just sit in a classroom Um, and that was something that until I was in my late twenties, I didn't even realize was ADHD. Um, thank God for my therapist. But I, for me, it was just trying to survive school. My mom, you know, you, you look back and you wish your parents would have pushed you a little differently. Uh Um, my, my parents didn't have the highest expectations. And I think that that, you know, I see how that affected me. And so I'm definitely different with my son. Um, but for my mom, it was like, if you, if you pass, you're good. If I don't have to get called down to the school, you're good. And so I'm pretty sure I was like a C, C minus student. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So I want to back up a little bit too. Yeah. Um, this is kind of funny to me. So for different reasons, we led the same childhood in junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. I was always the short fat kid. And so, um, yes, I, I hung out with very pretty women all the time. But it was always just friends. But here's the thing. They would tell me everything. I learned exactly. more about women in that period of time and <laughs> than I learned the whole rest yes. of my life. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I learned what people liked and what they didn't mm-hmm. like. And Because when you're a friend, man, you hear everything. everything. Was that your experience? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that that made me... That definitely like prepared me to be a good partner moving forward, but also um, just knowing how to actually talk to a woman and then not being afraid to talk to a woman. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely appreciated that. You know, looking back though, there, I I can, I think I remember like everybody's ex boyfriend and what they did wrong still. Right. 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 I I guess, you know, that kind of experience could make you a manipulative ass too. We've all been down that road, but, but yes, for the most part, it does make you a good partner. So, so you get through, you get through high school, um, you graduate. Now what happens? Uh, So I graduated high school. I started going to school at LCC because everyone said that I needed to go to college. And I started interning with ESPN, holding the boom mic at Uh the Michigan state games. And that was a lot of fun. Um, But in doing so, I, I fell into the same routine, which was just class was hard for me. If I I sit down in a classroom, I just immediately want to fall asleep. Um, so I started to struggle in school and I found out that I'm very good at blackjack. So I would go up to the casino and I would just stay up at the casino and I would make hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And then I would come back and I would maybe go to class once or twice. And then I'd go back to the casino and I was like, this is not good. No, um, a buddy of mine. Um, so I actually wanted to join the military, um, in high school. And, but my mother is like, I, I mentioned earlier, she is a hippie in every sense of the word. And so she was very much against it. And you know, this is peak Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. So, my high school girlfriend at the time, she didn't want me to go. And, um, well, I'm in this routine of going to the casino instead of going to school. And, uh, a friend of mine joined, I didn't know he joined, but he joined and he showed up in his dress greens and he knocked on my door and I literally, I answered the door and I go, where do I sign up? (laughs) And we went down to the recruiting station and I signed up Yeah, and I didn't tell anybody, uh, that I was leaving until, I was leaving on December 27th and I told everybody on Christmas because I didn't want to get shit for it. Obviously I did. And then one of the things my mom was like, you're going to get yourself killed. My dad was like, what do you want to get blown up? And then obviously as we'll find out later, I did. He felt terrible about it. Right. I thought it was hilarious. (laughs) It's funny, but it's not Mm -hmm. right. But I I think when you live 
through something, it you have a different perspective. You have on to. It. You yeah. have to oh. have a morbid sense of humor, or otherwise it'll kill you. You do. You do. That's why when my son and I get together at the holidays, our family looks at us really funny. Absolutely. Yeah. He he served as well. So you uh, you leave. <laughs> You leave right in the Christmas season then yes. for, for basic. Where'd you go to basic? I went to basic at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, home of the field artillery. So, um, you know, I, I didn't really know what to anticipate. Again, I came out of high school, like softer than tissue paper. Uh-huh. I couldn't do a push up to save my damn life. And, uh, so the red phase of basic training was tragically hard for me. I, I cried. I wanted to die. I hated it so much. And your mom, your mom's lap wasn't there by the way. Exa- and my mom's lap was <laughs> not there guys. Yeah. Uh, and you know, my high school sweetheart wasn't there and I was just struggling. Yeah. Um, and then my stepdad, uh, developed cancer. And so my drill sergeant came in and I remember we were like out in the field doing some sort of exercise and he, he came and he was like, listen, you can go home but if you quit, you'll quit forever. And so I didn't, and I finished and it like in that moment changed everything. All of a sudden I could run and pass my PT test and it just, it turned something on in me. And so I was all in. And, um, I think that it was just, I just had never had anybody do that for me. Right. I'd never been challenged like that. That was some no shit good yes, advice right there. Exactly. Buddy. <laughs> exactly. Cause he knew. Yeah. In that, in that phase of basic training, if you can leave, you, you're not coming back. You're not that. coming back. No, mm-hmm. no, not at all. What, what were some of your, so we, we kind of talked kind of high level about basic training, how it was difficult. What do you remember is like, like maybe one or two of your just biggest struggles in trying to get through basic training? Um, so I think for me, uh, I was just, I was just a soft kid. So when these very large men are in my face screaming, I'm noticeably scared. You know, I couldn't stop shaking. I I was not, you know, they, they make you a soldier. You're not born one. And I definitely was not born one. Um, So for me, it was just uh, the intensity of the drill instructors and then the physical demands. Again, I, um, you know, I played uh, roller hockey growing up, Mm -hmm. but we didn't have the money for me to do anything else. And so uh, physically I'd never been challenged like that. And I just, I'd never felt my leg sore like that. And I'd never, you know, I'd never really been sleep deprived like that. So it was just the mental and physical anguish of it was harder than I anticipated. But on some level it feels really good. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. I mean, looking back, you know, looking back, they, they were building me and I, I needed to be built. So uh-huh. I'm very thankful for it, but it, damn, it was hard. Well, if you look at the premise of, of basic training, right, it's to break people down and build them back up. Now I'm, I wonder, like we could hypothesize on this. Do you think it's harder for someone? I'll say like you and I, because when I went to basic training, I was not a tough guy at all. I was still not really a tough guy, but do you think that it's harder for the people who are prepared than it is for the people who are not prepared? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I mean, I think that we were moldable, Uh huh. you know, we're like soft as Play-Doh, but you get those guys who think they're hot shit already and think that everything's going to come easy and then it doesn't. And that's a, it's a lot harder for them mentally than it is us. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, they're used to just being able to do it. Exactly. So did you make some, did you make some lasting friendships in basic? Yeah. So in basic training, um, my, uh, one of well, the guy like in the next bunk over, his name was Andrew Grit Savage. Uh, he and I ended up being stationed together and he was one of the guys that saved my life. Oh, mm-hmm. all right. I can't wait to get to that part. Yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so clearly you made it through basic training. Um, what, what was your MOS and where'd you go to AIT yeah. and all that stuff? So I was 13 Bravo field artillery. Uh, my AIT was at Fort Sill. It was like that combination yeah. that like started AIT right after. Um, and then I was stationed uh, at first 320th field artillery out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, I'm so very thankful that I was. I, I remember getting, you know, you get your orders in basic. And I, I, I was so excited to be 101st. And, um, and it would graduate basic. And I, I show up uh, at Fort Campbell. And the first person to walk in and come get me is a guy named Sergeant Forbes, Josh Forbes. And uh, he had had his first, his face burned off, uh, in a helicopter accident on November 15th, 2003. And so 
he walks in with like a messed up face. And I was like, what the fuck have I done? Sorry if I'm not. But I was like, it was like, what have I done? Right. Oh my God. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, I was just, I was surrounded by great leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people will complain in the military about their leadership. That's not one thing I would ever do. Those, those men were awesome. Well, I'm going to ask a really stupid question. Right Go now. for it. It, it, it. Well, maybe there's no stupid question. You might get a stupid answer. There's some inquisitive idiots though. There, I like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you talked about coming to eat rabbits from Lansing, right? Yeah. And you're like the only black guy yep. here. Yep. Then you go to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, not exactly the bastion of African American society. And then you end up in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And I don't want to dwell on this at all, but I'm guessing that you got this whole different kind of education about human relationships that maybe some of your friends who just stayed in one spot didn't get. I mean, I'm a master code switcher. You yeah. know, I can definitely hold my own in most rooms. Uh-huh. Um, but overall, I would say the number one thing that I took away from it was uh, people everywhere are are equally broken. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I don't want to have this whole this whole discussion. This is just I, I got to ask these questions. So, you know, I I know that in growing up and some of the things that I did, it was important for me to see people like me being successful. And so I, I don't know how I would have done if I hadn't had those examples. Yeah. And so how was that for you? Because you're, you're successful. I mean, so you know what I mean? Like, that, so that's why I, I always say I'm so thankful for those men. Uh, and I wouldn't change anything about my military experience, even though it ended so badly. Right. Was they were, um, let me rewind really quickly. Uh, my best friend, Brian, his father was an incredible father figure for me. Okay. Grow uh, in high school, toward the end of high school. But uh, these men were the first people to really challenge me and hold me, uh, hold like expectation of me. And I think that I really needed that. And so um, all of a sudden I'm surrounded by, um, you know, and it wasn't just white guys, these strong black and white men who all have, you know, different ages and different living situations. And all of them were so put together. And I think I really needed to see that. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, um, every one of them were instrumental into who I am now. So I'm successful because of them. And maybe I'm full of crap here, but in the military, in the time that I spent both in the Navy and in the army, uh, there was not the type of racism that I saw outside of the military. I'm not saying it didn't exist, but it was it was just different. I mean, we treated people equally poorly. In well, the and, and that's equally poorly is what matters. And so, right. I mean, in the military, you're you're not going to avoid a racist joke. Right. I mean, my my section chief was, you know, he's from West Virginia, and half of my units from Texas. And so, you hear things, but at the same time, all that we cared about was that we were brothers. Right. And that transcended everything, which really makes racism itself look pretty stupid if you can put on a uniform and it's all of a sudden it doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter at all anyway. Yeah. Just throwing it out there. That's a possibility. Well, let's get into it. So you go to AIT, um, you uh, you go to your first duty station, um, and this is, is this the time that you deploy? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I was at Fort Campbell for three months before we deployed. Uh-huh. Um, I remember, you know, I remember our first sergeant, uh, first Sergeant McKinley uh, walking out in front of us and saying, all right, we just got our orders. And I remember starting to shake and it was like, okay, this shit just got real. Yeah. Um, it's not a movie. It's not a movie. And, you know, I don't remember. I remember the night uh, we left like really early morning and uh, there was a guy named, uh, Sergeant Floyd, Clarence LeVon Floyd. And he, um, I remember I was like really scared before we got on the buses to go to the plane. And he was like, listen, I'm going to get you home. And I believed him. And, uh, so, you know, we fly to, what is it? Ireland and then Kuwait and, uh, Shannon, Ireland. Is right? that where it was? Shannon, See, Ireland. Everyone goes to Shannon. It's Ireland. such a blur to me now, yeah. but I did buy a lucky an Irish lucky penny when I was there uh-huh. and I kept it on my person. And then I ended up being the only one that lived. So you do the math. Um, wow. I, uh, um, you know, we get to Kuwait and I remember, you know, I always, 
I remember like the first time that you open the door at like 1 p.m. and it feels like an oven hit you in the face. And it's just like, where am I? Well, when, so when people talk about dry heat, so I remember getting to Kuwait. First of all, it's like being on Mars, right? Mm-hmm. It's got that fine powdery yeah. sand and it's just, ugh. Anyway, so yeah, I tell people, yeah, it's dry heat. Stick your head in the oven and then turn on a friggin' hair dryer. Exactly. That's dry That's heat, dry my heat. friend. Yes. And it's still, it sucks just as bad as yeah. not dry heat. It hurts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm with you. So we, uh, we go from Kuwait to Camp Taji, which is north of Baghdad. It's where Saddam's airfield was. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we can get into that discussion another time, but, uh, they said there were no weapons of mass destruction, but people from camp Taji keep dying of cancers. So right. Cool. Yeah. What was going on? Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that later though. Uh, so I get to camp Taji and, um, we, so we we're in these trailers, which is nice, right? I'm not in one of those tents. Like a lot of people get stuck in. So you guys are in, in choose, right? The yes. containerized yep. housing units. Yeah. Okay. And yep. so we, uh, we broke in, we went over and took some of the air forces mattresses, uh-huh. um, and made our places a little nicer. And, uh, yeah. So we were, our, um, area of operation was just outside of Camp Taji to the North, um, off of route Tampa. And I can't remember the little towns anymore. Um, on a Google map though, I can show you exactly where I got blown up, yeah. but we, um, you know, we started out, uh, just doing route patrols and for the, uh, um, the first, yeah, the first 45 days, no, two and a half, the first two and a half months, um, there, no one died. There would be shots taken and, you know, everything kept missing us, and you really get a Superman complex going. So, yeah, <laughs> when you said that, it, it just it struck a, a memory mm-hmm. with me. And so, you know, I remember doing right seat, left seat, and um, the first time we got shot at, like I'm ducking down, I'm in an up armored Humvee, mm-hmm. like nothing's gonna hurt me. And in the commander that I was relieving kind of chuckled at me and then fast forward to when it was time to come home it was the same thing it's amazing what you get used to yeah in a very short period of time and yes you start to feel like ah, nothing can yeah. hurt me exactly right so you're 45 days what year were you there i'm sorry 2005 okay so you were, you were there just shortly before i was yeah deadliest months of iraq yeah. and um so november 5th <laughs> i'm sorry my bad uh yeah november 5th 2005 um we were our November, I'm sorry, November 3rd, 2005, we were out, uh, out on a route patrol and we decided that we were going to pull over and use the metal detectors, like make sure the driveways and stuff were clear. Yeah. And we ended up finding what was the, at that time, the largest weapons cache in Iraq. And so, um, I have a really cool video to show you sometime of, uh, of that getting blown up by EOD. Uh, and then all of it started falling on us. It's really uh-huh. entertaining, but <laughs> Nice. But like, yeah, so we just, you know, we were having fun. Right. Um, I don't know if you ever saw like these mud huts that they would have built outside of actual houses. Uh-huh. Um, and so there, there was like five or six of these mud huts outside of this house um, that they'd been forced to leave. And so we were blowing off steam and we were throwing each other through the walls of these, of these mud huts. And then the villagers got upset. Right. And, it was their mud huts. And humans. rightfully so, because now if someone did that to my stuff, I would shoot them myself. Yeah. Um, but looking back, I was a kid. We were just being dumb and inconsiderate. Um, but November 6th, uh, 2005, um, my platoon sergeant, uh, his Humvee was hit with an IED and it was... I believe it was going like 35 to 45 miles an hour. And then it just flipped on its back. The gunner, he broke his back, but lived. Um, But my, uh, my set, my platoon Sergeant smoke Hayes, he was killed instantly. And that's when shit got real. Right. All of a sudden, everything feels very different. Yeah. Um, And that funeral, I remember, you know, now I'm seeing all these grown men that I really look up to, uh, bawling their eyes out. Smoke Hayes was one of the old school types. He would run at the front of the A group in PT mm-hmm. with a mug and a cigarette in his hand and never fell out. Like he was just the coolest hardcore dude. And 
Uh, so it, it really, it really shook us. Um, I've, I've been to a lot of funerals, mm-hmm. but there's something different about a funeral in Iraq. I agree. They're really, they're, they're just in it and it's impactful. Yeah. Like I don't like going to funerals at all. Mm-hmm. I've lost a lot of friends since I got home, but it was the ones that I went to over there that I will never forget. And then they're like, Hey, get your helmet on. We got things to do. Yeah. Time, and- time to get back into it. And I think that that really does uh, change you as a person long term, mm-hmm. because my ability to, um, you know, take the punches and keep rolling, I think I think a lot of that's attributed to what happens in in the military. Yeah. So let's get back to smoke haze. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, but, you're but totally I'm, fine. I'm feeling it. Uh, so smoke haze. Uh, he, his wife Kathy, um, to this day. Uh, is, is like the glue that holds that unit together. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, it's been awesome to watch his kids grow up and have kids. And um, Smoke Hayes was just, he was the first person to uh, to challenge me in running. So mm-hmm. like, yeah, I, I graduated basic, but I still wasn't fast. And I was, I was 18 and 19, like I should be faster. Right. Uh, so he was like, you run an A group? And I was like, B group. And he was like, A group. And I was like, a group it is. And I could argue with this guy. Exactly. Never fell out. Like that was, you know, I, I just, I was, I ended up in the right place Yeah. and, and he was a hell of a leader. So we go out, um, that's, you know, November 6th, uh, the days following, um, again, things are just quiet. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's, um, you know, some, some random route checks, um, I got the nickname water boy because we like pulled the car over and we had to check through the vehicle. And right. this guy had driven like 40 miles to get water. And then I spilled it accidentally. Yeah. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. And so then they called me the water boy from now on, uh-huh. from then on. Um, <laughs> you don't get to pick your nickname. You by the don't way. get to pick your nickname. You just have to be careful. Exactly. Um, and so then November 15th, 2005, we, uh, we were on a route patrol between two checkpoints, checkpoint four and checkpoint six. And, um, you know, those mud huts that I told you about, uh, there was a long driveway there mm-hmm. and we had pulled over and got the, um, metal detector out and checked the driveway before, but we were literally parked on top of the IEDs when we did that. And so this day when we went to turn around, someone set off three one five five artillery rounds with a cell phone and I was sitting, um, I'm going to rewind a sec. So, uh, we were doing route clearances that day and Greg, um, specialist Greg was driving and he was like, man, I'm really tired. Will you drive? And I said, dude, I was like, I'm falling asleep too. Uh, I was like, can I have like an hour? And he's like, yeah, no problem. Mm-hmm. And so I get in behind him and, um, we decided that we were going to turn around and go back to checkpoint four for food. So we turned around in that driveway. And when we did, uh, I look over at my Humvee and grit savage, the guy I told you about from basic training, he's the gunner on the other Humvee. And we always did the little rascals wave at each other. And so he waved at me and I waved back at him. And then I like settled into my seat and I started to put my head down and it felt like the truck dropped, um, The only way I can explain it is like it dropped twice, like the right side dropped and then the left side dropped. And when it did that, I looked up and over and Sergeant Eastep, he curls into a ball and he sits back and explodes. And I scream and look over and our, at our medic doc Holly and he's on fire and I'm flying out of the truck. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I flew through the truck. I don't know if I opened the door. I know that when I twitch to this day, my body turns to the left and my head turns to the right. And uh, I knew what was happening in that moment. And when they talk about time slowing down, I mean, what's happening is your adrenal glands are pumping so much, your brain's taking information in, and it seems like it's buffering like on a computer. But I remember vividly all of these scenes. And then I hit the ground. I was thrown 150 feet from the truck. And when I woke up, my right foot was in my boot sitting to my left. I, I woke up and I like knew what happened, but I like, I hurt obviously. And I like start patting my body and like I pat my face and I feel, um, I feel that my face is burned. And then when I get down to my hips, I can't feel below my hips and I start screaming for help. 
Um, and I mean, I, I didn't even really feel the pain yet. It was just fear. Um, I, I started screaming for help and Floyd, the guy who promised me that I'd get home, he heard me and ran over and put a tourniquet on my leg. Um, and then he was like, he was like, I hear Roman. I have to go get Roman. And a guy named Groth like uh, knelt down and Groth and I were not close and we haven't spoken since this night. Okay. Um, but he held my hand and I was like, I don't want to die. And he's like, just keep breathing, man. And Floyd, Floyd had told me just keep breathing. And then Groth told me just keep breathing. And then, and, uh, Grit Savage ran over and same thing. He was like, battle, just keep breathing. And so I closed my eyes and like, just keep breathing, just keep breathing. And I pass out. And when I woke up, uh, I woke up from the heat, from the rotors Mm -hmm. hitting my face and they're like, all right, man, this is going to hurt. And when they picked me up, uh, on the gurney, my right foot fell off and swung. And like, that's when I, that's when the pain hit me. Yeah. Uh, the, the only morphine that we had was on doc Holly. So it's gone. Right. And so I get put on the, um, the black Hawk and flown to, uh, to the green zone, mm-hmm. to the hospital in the green zone. And as, as we're flying, um, Roman is put underneath me and Roman was from Puerto Rico. And so when Roman would get hurt, he would speak Spanish and me being the 19 year old dickhead I was, I would always make fun of him when he started speaking Spanish. And I'm like, bro, speak English. Like, what are you doing? And so even on the helicopter, I'm like, Roman, you have got to start speaking English and just kind of razzing him. Uh Um, But I went into shock at this point and I don't remember any of it. When we get on to the hospital, uh, the guy in the helicopter turns to me and he's like, dude, you're hilarious. Don't die. And <laughs> thanks for the advice. <laughs> I, right. Um, I, I get put on a gurney and I remember them being like, all right, you're going to go to sleep now. And I feel like the warmth in my leg and I passed out. Yeah. Uh, um, I was asleep for 15 hours. And in that time they tried to fly Roman to Balad, uh, to a hospital there for a blood transfusion. And he died in the air. Mm-hmm. And so when I woke up, um, my foot was, like uh, connected with an ex- uh, an external fixator, like holding it in place and super wrapped up. And uh, you know, I, I was like, I was pretty numb. I would say from the drugs, I think, but I, my first Sergeant and my captain uh, first Sergeant McKinley and captain Jenkins were standing at the end of my bed and they're like, Hey, you know, we've, we've come to present you with your purple heart. And so I'm like, okay, you know, thank you. They, they go through and they read everything and they give me a purple heart. And I'm like, okay, so where's everybody else? Right. And in that moment, it all came back to me. Yeah. Um, Sergeant, uh, first Sergeant McKinley had a tear like on his face and I just knew that they're gone and it, it just crushed me. I was, I was the youngest in my unit. Um, you know, three of, uh, two of them had kids, uh, all four of them had a, what I considered a brighter future at the time. I was devastated that they're like, you know, you, uh, we have to fly you to Balad for a blood transfusion and then to Longstuhl, Germany, and then you'll fly back to Walter Reed. And so I flew to Germany and, um, you know, all I remember is like looking at the roofs and the, when I was in an ambulance or however they moved me and thinking like those look German, like that's really all I have of Germany. (laughs) Um, and so when I flew back to the U S Walter Reed was going through the, the chaos of being overpacked and all of that public pushback from their issues. And so I actually said, if you'll send me back to Fort Campbell, I would love to get back to my unit. Um, and so I got transferred back to Fort Campbell where my high school sweetheart was waiting and smoke Hayes's wife was waiting and Floyd's wife was waiting and they were with, you know, in the hospital with me, um, smoke Hayes's wife, Kathy, you know, she was visiting, um, Barrero, the guy that was in the truck with her husband when he was killed and Barrero and I were only a couple of rooms apart. So we would try to talk to each other as often as we could, um, Floyd had told Deidre, his wife, to take care of me. So she would sneak me chicken nuggets and stuff. Um, But I, you know, I, I wasted away. I went from 186 pounds to 123 pounds. Uh, I, I, 
I couldn't do anything. I was in, you know, incredible pain, incredibly depressed. I didn't want to eat. I just, I, I was really, if I could have willed myself to die, I would have mm-hmm. at that point. Um, but I, I was lucky in that time to have my high school sweetheart there who took care of me and slept next to me in a chair every night. And, uh, the morning of December 10th, uh, 2005, um, I get a phone call like really early and the nurse comes in and she's like, Hey, you know, uh, uh, Deidre's on the phone for you. And I was like, Oh, okay. And I answered the phone. I was like, Hey Deidre, what's up? And she just screamed into my ear. They killed Floyd. And so then the guy who promised me that I'd get home and save me, um, he was shot by a sniper relieving grit savage early from watch. Right. And, uh, that, that destroyed me. I mean, obviously it destroyed me. Now you can see it. My whole demeanor changes. I can't, None of it makes sense. Floyd. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if you, if you want to get religious about it, like what is your plan there? God, please explain it to me. Yeah. Cause if the, if, if there's supposed to be some justice and who gets to live a long life, this isn't it. And, um, that was when I, I, I lost that, that edge. I didn't want to kill anybody. I didn't want to fight anymore. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to be left alone, you know? And so I had to learn to walk again. And so I went from uh, a wheelchair to walker to crutches to cane through the whole thing. And uh, it was excruciating. It was awful. You know, I I couldn't curl a five pound weight when I got out of the hospital. Um, uh, But I was, again, I was lucky to have an incredible uh, support system. Right. Um, Michelle, my high school girlfriend at the time, her, uh, her brother is to this day, my very best friend. I call him my heterosexual life partner, (laughs) Brian. Um, and, and so, you know, between Brian and Michelle and Brian and Michelle's dad, Rick, I was, um, you know, I had the people that I needed to get through that. Right. Um, my family was great, but you know, family is always more complicated. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a nice way to put it. Yeah, I, and I don't want to. I, I don't want to keep taking you back. To no, this, you're but, fine. But we can talk about it. What strikes me is that a lot of times we th- we wonder why them and not me, right? Why did why did that guy lose a leg, or why did that guy die, or why did why did that girl get get crushed, or whatever it was? So Greg was blown into six pieces. Yeah, he'd asked me to drive. Yeah, I should have been driving. Right. Now, had I been driving, maybe I turned a little differently and everything changes anyway. You don't know, but you can what if that shit to death. Well, and so I, I think the way I look at that stuff is everything that's happened to us brings us to this point in time mm-hmm. that we're at right now. You and me sitting here having this conversation. So when I think about the people, when I think about the people who got hurt doing what I asked them to do. Yeah. Um that's always very hard for me. But when I, when I think about those situations, I think that part of it is those people who went before us were put there so that we could get here yeah, for whatever reason. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's always kind of helped me um, through it. Not, not, not that, it, not that it's placating, mm-hmm. but it's like, it's like the guy said, I'm going to get you home alive. Yeah. He never said he's going to get himself home alive. Absolutely right? true. So somewhere in there, his job was to make sure that you got home. Well, I, um, you know, I came to find out years later that everybody else in my Humvee had the premonition that they would not be making it home mm-hmm. and Except had told that exactly. I, I even refused to make a will because I said it wasn't an option. Right. And, you know, others had called home and said, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to make it And that. Like, again, it just, you know, if there's, there's a destiny and it was preordained, um, I wish I would have got the memo. Right. That would have been great. Right. And it's a, it's a whole like other philosophical discussion about, about all of this, but there's always so much guilt for, for the people that come home in one piece. Yeah. Um, as opposed to people who don't come at all or, Mm -hmm. or come home in several pieces. And so, you know, I, 
I know you had a long recovery and Mm -hmm. it wasn't just because your foot. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other stuff going on. So what was that like for you? I mean, it, right. So if you, it, it was hard because I was young. Um, the men that I looked up to most in the world were all dead. And I was on methadone, Prozac, Xanax. Then they moved me down to Oxycontin because that helps. Um, you know, I was, I went through all of the drugs and I was, you know, I was cutting my fentanyl patches open and eating it. I was snorting my Xanax. I was doing everything I could to be as numb as possible. And so, you know, my, my friends and family, they all, they all know it now, but from 2006 till when Obama got elected, I I don't really know what happened. I worked at a jewelry store. I dated a girl. I lived in Florida, but I don't really know uh, that I was so lost and just trying to survive the day that um, I wasted, I wasted some good time, but is there like a, culminating event that made you finally get your shit together yes so i mean if i'm if i'm getting ahead of us no no you're i, totally I don't want to do that but i'm like okay no, you're totally fine because i'm looking at this guy he's got his shit together now so something happened thank you um i'm glad that you believe that um so i uh 2008 right so i moved back to i lived in florida for a minute with a girl and it didn't work out and i moved back and i ended up getting back with my ex uh michelle and we, we were living together and I was still struggling. She, she struggled with my PTSD, which I completely understand. And, um, you know, it was just, we were young and we were holding on to who I was when I was in high school. And that kid was long dead. Right. And so, um, 2000 and 2010 um, Michelle and I broke up and I, I went into a bar and the bartender, uh, she was hot. Um, she, she like leans over, you know, the cleavage shot. And she says, what can I get you? And I kind of like stuttered through saying a Budweiser. I was like, Budweiser. Uh-huh. And, we talked for a few hours and then I left and I didn't ask her for a number because I'm super bashful. And I went back again and we had the same thing and I didn't ask her for a number. And so she was convinced I was gay. Right. Um, but I took a friend of mine with me one time and she like facilitated the conversation and we ended up hanging out with this girl and, uh, her name is Brianna. And so we, um, uh, Brian and Brianna, it's gross. We, um, <laughs> there's not even a good name no. to make out of that. No, exactly. We went to, um, uh, we went to Denny's and like talked for hours and she was like, yeah, this, she was like, Hey, this was great. We should do this again before I move. And I was like, well, wh- where are you moving? She's like, I'm, I'm moving to New York city. And, uh, so we saw each other every day until she left and, um, and then she moved and I, couldn't handle it. I mean, every weekend I was driving 10 hours to New York to see her. Uh And then I would drive back to be back at, I was selling jewelry at the time, uh, to be back at the jewelry store by Monday and 45 days in to us dating. I proposed, I drove out to New York. I actually called my friend and I was like, Hey, do you want to do something crazy? And she's like, are we going to New York to propose? I said, yes, we are. (laughs) <laughs> and so, so I just want, I, I just want to, I just want to say it's not lost on me that you took a page out of your mom's book. Well, it's it, it, right. Also like I very much live in the moment because yeah. of everything that happened. Well, because that moment can be gone. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean my mom, not, not only my mom, but like when you talk to people who have been married for 50, 60, 70 years, they knew immediately. Right. And I was like, yeah, I know immediately. Not understanding that uh, people have trauma and all of their own things and their own issues. And maybe I'm not actually healed from my PTSD yet. Maybe I've just been ignoring it for years. Maybe I just need a little adrenaline in my exactly. life. Something you know, some girl to marry me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I move out to New York City and... um uh, I started working uh, security um, right next to the World Trade Center, which was cool. Um, well, the World Trade Center site, they were building the tower. Right. Um, and um, 
a friend, my, uh, Brianna's friend was like, Hey, you should be a personal trainer. And I was like, mm, okay. And so I used my GI, but that was literally it. I <laughs> wish there was more to it, but I'm being totally honest. I was with hoping you. for a really good story, nah, but man, okay. I'm getting it. screwed here. That's yeah. Fine. Yeah. So trust me, the story gets good. So, okay. um, so I used my GI bill and I went to the American Academy of personal training, uh, which is in union square in New York. And, uh, I graduated and I got hired at a gym called Equinox. And before I ever went in there, a buddy of mine was like, Hey, I just got hired at this boxing gym. And I was like, well, I don't really know anything about boxing. And he was like, yeah, but they want to meet people. So how don't you come with me? So I went in there and I met the owner, Alberto Ortiz. And then the general manager at the time, a guy named Lenny Adamo. And, um, I was instantly hooked. Lenny and I were like, we got along great. Uh, he was the only other country music fan that I knew in New York and I lived in Eaton rapid. So I love country music at the time. And, (laughs) um, you know, I, uh, I was like, yeah, I want to do this. And so, um, Alberto and Lenny, they started teaching me, uh, everything that they knew, you know, and, uh, I started, working on what they called staff development and just really learning to box. And, you know, I had a rib broken and my nose broken and, um, but I loved it. Uh And then one day someone quit and Alberta was like, I need you to go teach that class. And so I went in and taught. And the minute that I walked in, um, all of those drill sergeants came back. All, all of the trauma was like ready to be released. And I just went ham and, and I, I, I always say trainer Brian is one of the most intense people you're ever going to meet. And I will scream in your face and then I'll lean in and whisper something super motivating to you personally. And I just, I've always loved it. I've always found for me, the gym was the escape after, you know, well, how do I deal with this anxiety and this rage and this pain uh, from Iraq? Well, for me, it was working out. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I couldn't curl five pounds when I got out of the hospital and I weighed, you know, 123 pounds. And, and today I weigh 250, but that's because, uh, I don't work out as much as I used to, but like I was sitting up right around 200 to 215. Yeah. Um, and so just rebuilding my body, I realized how, how important fitness is for you mentally as well. And so for me, it was always really fostering that relationship between physical fitness and the mental aspect of it. And so, um, Bree and I, um, I start, I start working at work train fight Mm -hmm. in in Manhattan and, um, I come to find out that my fiance has cheated on me. And so I, I'm like ready to leave and, uh, we're fighting a lot. And then my dad comes to town and we take him to a Yankee game and we're getting beers and Bree goes to drink a beer and she's like, you know what? I don't want this. And my dad leans over and goes, she's pregnant. And sure as shit, she sure was. Um, so all of a sudden, I have this new career, which is great, but I don't have a clientele yet. And right. I go into the gym, and I'm like, "Listen, I need clients. I have a kid coming. I need help." And so they, you know, they threw me some clients, and um, I think that that I, that motivation obviously was perfect for having to hustle as hard as I had to to build a clientele in New York City, which is a city full of shark trainers. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that being Midwestern and having, um, a, a likable disposition, I think really helps also when people find out the injuries I've been through and what I've come back from, I think that really helped people connect with me as well. Um, and so I was able to, you know, help the gym grow and grow. And when Gabe turned two, we didn't want him to be a New Yorker. So we came home. Right. And, uh, we, you know, decided to try to make things work, but, you know, like life goes, uh, sometimes you can't fix things. And so we, uh, we split up, um, in 2015. And, uh, at that time I was working, um, I was working at a couple of different gyms in the Lansing area and I started dating, started dating one of my clients and, uh, she was a wonderful woman, um, a little bit older than me, uh, and she was, she was great for me at the time. You know, mm-hmm. um, one of the things that she helped me do though, was start to face my PTSD. And so she, we actually planned a cross country road trip to go to each one of the graves. Um, and so we flew out to San Diego 
and went to Doc Holly's grave first. And then we drove to Inola, Oklahoma, where Griggs family was. And I got to go to Griggs grave and the, the, the guttural scream and the release and the opportunity to say goodbye to these people isn't something that I'd had. Um, so it was it was huge for me, and then we went to meet his family, and I I have I, you know I told them the same story I told you, and I apologized, and they're like, listen, he wouldn't want you to be miserable, right? He wouldn't want you to have died, and I know that, but I needed to hear it from them, mm-hmm. and it doesn't change that every now and then I still struggle with survivor's guilt, but to I I was able to leave some of that on that road trip. After I know Oklahoma, we went to, uh, oh man, it's called like Chillahoe, West Virginia. It is the podunk of podunk towns. Backwoods of the backwoods. I, I mean, right, guys, I, I, I'm not like the darkest of black guys, but I was uncomfortable. Yeah, you and, stood out. And I, we pull in and we can't really find the graveyard. So I see this like auto shop and this like big guy and suspenders. He's covered in oil. And I walk up and I'm like, Hey, you know, I, and I told my story, right? Cause if you're scared and in the South, the first thing you do is mention that you're a veteran. Right. Um, so I explained quickly why <laughs> That's a I was good there. Tip. Yeah, it is. It's survival tip. Yes. Um, and so I, I mentioned why I'm there and he's like, Oh, well I'm the mayor. And I was like, this tracks. Yeah. But he was like, actually, the top of the hill over there is where you're looking. And so I got to go to Sergeant Eastep's grave. And um, it, again, just the release of the pain and the opportunity to grieve and giving myself that space uh, was was really important for me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, after that, we went to Savannah, Georgia and had like a nice vacation for the last couple of days. And it was fantastic. Uh I haven't been able to go to uh, Roman's grave, the guy, the gunner who I was making fun of that night, uh, because he uh, uh, he was he's he's buried in uh, Puerto Rico, right? So, um, so you know, I've been able to have some closure there, and I think that that's uh, that's really helped me uh, progress, and and that is really all in thanks to to my ex at the time, Kim, mm-hmm. and so we. Uh, you know, when we're on this road trip and we're driving across Arizona, I I look over and I'm like, I should just start my own gym. And in that moment, it just made sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we get back and I tell some of my clients about it. And one of my clients was very enthusiastic about supporting me. And she went home and told her dad who had the finances to support us. And we were able to get the gym off the ground. And so I opened Empower Lansing in 2018, and it was a boxing gym, a boxing and fitness gym. Um, it I, it was the living embodiment of who I am. Um, you know, people always say that you shouldn't speak about politics at work. Well, the the gym was a sounding board for for my beliefs. Um, the rule number one, which I stole from work train fight was no assholes. And that really starts to, it sets the standard. You can believe whatever you want to believe, but you're going to leave that shit at the door, right? You're not going to make anybody in here feel unwelcome. And so for me, it was always creating a place where fitness really could be for everybody and not a no judgment zone, because I will give you shit if you're lazy, right? But, uh, you were always motivating. So we were always motivating each other. And it was the greatest community of people that I've ever known. And, and probably ever will now. Um, we, uh, Kim and I ended up splitting up uh, at the end of 26, oh man, I don't even know anymore. Or no, the, the end of 2018. Okay. And uh, the girlfriends coincide with every life story. Right. So, I'm, I'm detecting a pattern here. Yeah. So I do want to ask though, so you have custody of your son. So we have all yeah, so we've never gone to court because we could write a book on co parenting. That's awesome. Um uh so we, we basically have split custody. I would say she has him more uh-huh. uh because she's had more stability and because the gym required so much of my time. You know, yeah. owning a business is yeah. is its own child. 
And so, you know, Gabe loved the gym and he got to hang out and listen to all sorts of unedited music and run around in what was a giant playground for him. So, uh, I'm really glad that he had that experience though, because he also got to grow up in an environment where he saw strong people look all different ways. And, and, you know, I, I think that just really helps him as a person. Yeah, I can, I can see that. So, so you, you break up with Kim, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the gym's still going, gym's still going, going strong. Yep. So what happens now? All right. Well, so I ended up breaking up with Kim, uh, my fault guys. Um, I'll own that. It usually, it usually, it usually is. Fucking is, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I, uh, I met, uh, well, one of my, one, another one of my clients, um, uh, this wonderful, sweet Catholic school kindergarten teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, her and I started dating and, uh, I started going to church and I was eight, like I was, unfortunately, like the people I have dated have been, the victims of my healing process. Right. You know, and I think that that really happens to everybody, but, um, you know, her and I start dating and, uh, things are going well. Um, and then one night we're out. Um, so right. I'm, I'm converting to Catholicism. I'm going through RCIA now and, uh, we go hang out with some of her friends who, whom I love also. And we're sitting uh, we're sitting at an Irish bar and uh, they say something along the lines of uh, like, oh, yeah, I have some gay friends, but I know they're going to go to hell. And in that moment, I was like, oh, I'm not at the right table. Yeah. Like, I shouldn't. This isn't I don't want this. Right. And that's just not who I am. And so um, uh, Emily and I break up uh, in 2020. And. COVID hits. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I have a lot of clients at the time and my clients, sometimes our businesses will, you know, cross over. Mm -hmm. And one of those businesses that crossed over was, uh, I trained a massage therapist. And when COVID started, she was like, Hey, do you want to quarantine together? And I was like, yes, I do. (laughs) Yes, I do. And, uh, so, um, you know, Maggie and I quarantine together and start dating and we're allowed to grow and thrive in this bubble that is COVID uninterrupted um, in a state with legalized marijuana, guys. I'm just going to say that <laughs> you really get to know somebody when you're quarantined with them, right? Because I was married to my wife for a few years before COVID hit, you really get to know that yes. person you're living with. So, yes. So I just want to, I just want to get that out there, but yes. So marijuana is legal in Michigan yes, and you're quarantining. So, so we're quarantining and you know, we are getting to know each other and, and really well, we think uh, the issue is when, and there's a, there's actually like a term COVID divorces, uh-huh. there's uh, COVID babies, there's COVID there's, babies. Yeah. yeah. And stuff. right. So we fell in love during COVID. And so we're in this bubble where we don't have to experience the rest of the world together. Right. And it, you know, it definitely uh, throws you a curveball later on, but uh, Maggie and I are, are thriving. George Floyd happens. Right. And this is the first time where as a black man, I've ever stopped to be like, oh, I've never really been a part of my community. And uh, I didn't realize how many of the people in my life didn't even look at me as black. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, like most people with 2020 and everything, you know, friendships were lost and friendships were made. And one of the things that I did was I got on Ancestry.com and I went down a rabbit hole and I found out that my great, great grandfather was a guy named Alexander Pearson. And he was an escaped uh, enslaved man from Burke County, North Carolina. And he escaped and became one of the first black landowners in the state of Tennessee. And I went down to that land because his daughter, uh, my great grandmother opened a colored school in 1931 called Buffalo colored school. And there were still remnants of it. So I wanted to go there. Uh, Alexander's grave is also a protected marker in, in Tennessee. And so I went to his grave, Maggie and I went to his grave and this is during COVID. So it's easy enough to go on a road trip. Yeah. And 
Uh, we went and found the cornerstone and we carried like 120 pounds of granite out of the woods. And I got to go on this, you know, have this amazing experience. Then we went to the plantation that he escaped from, which is now a golf course called Silver Creek Plantation. Uh, but they, they're dropping plantation because of the negative connotation. Oh, you think? Of course. Yes. Um, uh, but it, you know, it, it allowed, I guess it, like a lot of people, it, that whole period of time activated me as an activist and really I became outspoken, um, not just about civil rights, just about rights in general and just how important as an American it is to make sure that we're protecting other people's rights as well. And so that, that also mixed in with empower and what I was teaching and what I was putting on the walls and what I was putting in the front window and, it attracted uh, a lot of attention from the political movers in Lansing. And um, my, the first ward in Lansing, uh, the city councilman resigned. And so they had to appoint a city councilman. And so I applied for the job. You know, I had made a lot of, uh, a lot of political friends through empower. Cause it was right on Michigan Avenue, right up the street from city hall. Oh, and, yeah. um, and so I, you know, it just seemed like no, no time, than, no better time than the present to throw my hat into the ring. And so I applied and I became the city councilman uh, for the first ward of Lansing. And at that time, I had to automatically start campaigning to keep the job. Right. So I had one year uh, of being a councilman, campaigning and running a small business and being married and being a dad. You were busy. Yeah, I underestimated how hard that would be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things to my credit and to my detriment is that I am tenacious. And uh, I'll always say yes and then figure out how to do it. Yeah. And that's obviously, it comes back to bite you. And this time it came back to bite me. I ended up losing my campaign by 56 votes. Mm -hmm. uh, I just couldn't knock on enough doors. I had to be at work. I had to be home. I had to take care of my marriage. And I pick and chose what I thought were the most important things at the time. And it cost me the job. That being said, uh, my predecessor who I did not like has done a great job. And I, I'm really happy that he's doing so well. I got to ask you a question. Yeah. I got to stop you for just a second. Hit me. 56 votes. 56 so votes. Here's my question. Yeah. Would you rather lose in a landslide or by 56 vote, votes. I mean, a buddy honestly. of mine lost by 18. Yeah. And so that was more painful. Yeah, screw but that. yeah, I would. Yeah. It was 56 hurt. Um, but at least I knew that so many people supported me. It right. wasn't that I did a bad job. Campaigning is a job in itself. Mm -hmm. And I'm not traditionally someone who's good at asking for help. And because of that, I didn't ask for door knockers. And when people were like, do you want help? I'm like, no, I got it. But I should have, right. it, uh, you know, that's kind of a typical, that's kind of a typical veteran thing right yeah, there, exactly. right? Oh, I got it. Don't worry. I can handle this. I've, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Exactly. Which lends itself to not getting better from PTSD and other things, but absolutely. So, so it was a detriment to your, your campaign, but I mean, 56 votes, you're yeah. right. It was, that was close. Yeah. And so, you know, people, people really wanted me to stay involved. Uh, but as that ended, I realized that I'd taken my eye off the ball with empower and um, you know, I, you know, I'll own the fact that I was irresponsible in the sense that I just was not focused enough on my business. And right. so now empower is in trouble and my marriage isn't thriving because I've been focused on all of these other things. And it's, you know, it's not Maggie's fault, but we're now um, we're now in this position where uh, the gym is struggling. I lost the council job um, you know, what's next. Right. And, uh, Oh God. Okay. So, um, next was, uh, I get this, this Facebook message from a reporter and they're like, Hey, so, uh, I just confirmed with a source that you sent a nude photo to somebody. And I'm just wondering who you took it to, uh, who you took it for, like who you sent it to on your city phone. And I'm like, well, that's not true. And so I start calling, trying to find out what's going on and um, come to find out that my personal videos, and it was at literally just a video of me, like I like shaved my head and I used my phone to check my head. Uh -huh. But sure, yeah, I was naked. I'll give you that. 
Um, but it had uploaded to the cloud. So it wasn't on the phone, but the pho- it was on the cloud. And then when I logged in on that phone, it went to the phone. Right. So the police, like, you know, they, they looked into it and they're like, he did nothing wrong. But that, that instance, I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be in this. Like this was a mistake and it could have destroyed me. Like this is, I don't want to do this. And so I, I just wanted to focus on the gym and getting the gym healthy and, and, you know, uh, being able to reconnect with my wife and see my son more. And, um, uh, you know, I, I really don't want to throw other people under the bus, but long story short, the gym didn't end up staying open either. Right. And so, uh, in October of 2024, the gym closed after five years, like just, just under five and a half years. And, um, that was, I mean, that was devastating to me. That was, that was honestly like losing a child. And I know that people who have lost a child would tell me that it's nothing like it, but I would say that people who've owned a business and have lost it would understand what I mean. Right. And you know, my blood, sweat and tears and my personality and everything that I've been for this, it just meant nothing. It was just gone. And so I, I was lost and my marriage isn't doing well because um, it's funny. The thing about marriage is you actually have to work on them. Yeah. 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 You know, it's work. It's wild. <laughs> yeah. No one told me. No. I thought like we liked each other. It would just keep going that way. That's not how this works. So right. apparently you're supposed to communicate and reassure each other. And you know, my wife, uh, she, you know, everyone has a history. And so, you know, we, we, definitely let things uh, we, we neglected things that we shouldn't have. And, and so now I I've lost the council job. Um, my marriage is on the rocks. I've lost the gym and I'm just this bum. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm 37. That's gotta be how it feels. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't right. want to start over. I'm exhausted. I, I worked so hard and it was all for fucking nothing. Um, and in reality, it wasn't, I learned so many things and I met so many people. And for me, empower saved lives. There were multiple people who told me that, that the gym saved their life, that they were going to kill themselves and our community helped them through that. And that makes it all worth it. Um, so if you, if you think, so if you kind of juxtapose this against your, your time in Iraq, right? Yes. And, and I'm not making any of it looks small, but when you think about the guy that said, I'm gonna make sure you get home and then he died. If you put that next to your gym, right? Mm -hmm. Your your gym made sure that some people got home. Yeah. And then it died. And then it died. Right. So it like served a purpose. Yes, absolutely. Uh, And it it just, it doesn't serve a purpose anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that in order for, for me to grow as a person, um, for my marriage, for, for my relationship with my son, I needed to have a job uh, and a lifestyle that didn't have me walking into the gym at 5 a.m. and leaving at 8 p.m. Right. I just didn't, it couldn't work anymore. It's great if you're single. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure. You'll stay single, but it's great if you're single. Yep. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm home for months, moping, feeling terrible about myself. Um, And, during the during the time that Empower was open, um, one of the things that I've been really focused on was doing any fundraising that I could for the VFW National Home. Uh, this, like you know, I've always credited this place with why I joined the military and why I, uh, you know, how I ended up becoming who I am. And so I had done some fundraising videos for the home, and um, in that time, you know, I met Sue Alverson, who is the uh, Oh my gosh. Devel- development, development director. director yes. Oh my development gosh, director. guys. Yeah, the yeah. Development director. Also my boss. Um, and Sue called me and she was like, Hey, I think that we have this position opening up and we would really love to interview for it. And so here I am, you know, I was really excited to, to be, to be a part of, of where the VFW national home is going uh, because it has grown so much in the time that I've been watching it and, and helping. And so now to be able to be here and to implement my own ideas and to use my own life experience and to help other veterans who are struggling when I know what struggle is like, uh, it's, it's a gift. And so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. 
here we are. Yeah. So it's kind of, we talk about coming full circle. I mean, it's, it's really kind of come full circle. You're, you're not a year out of having lost your gym. No. We're talking almost a year, but here you are doing this. So that kind of begs the question, you know, what, what do you think the future looks like for Brian Daniels? Well, I, I keep telling people that the, the national home saved my life again, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and you know, my political aspirations are, are not, are non-existent, um, you know, and, and we'll talk more in the future about that, but, uh, what I can do here is, is really change lives. And what I loved about empower is being able to impact people. And so I get to do that here on a daily basis. And I'm surrounded by other veterans who also care equally about, uh, making this place successful. And so for me, um, I want to be here long term. Um, you know, I, I've made no, it's no secret that I would love to be the executive director here someday. And that means I have to go back to school according to the guy sitting across from me. So, uh, so I plan on going back to school and getting whatever I need to do to be able to be in a position where maybe someday I'm running this place or at least a director. And I, I just want to continue to be a part of, uh, of the national home growing and the, um, the public awareness of the home growing and, and being able to implement new ideas because this next hundred years is going to look a lot different than this last hundred years and the people that it serves and how it serves. And I just want to be part of that. Those are awesome aspirations. So one last thing uh, before we go, and I ask anyone who I interview the same question, you know, a hundred years from now when someone listens to this, or someone that you share it with listens to it. What do you want people to take away from our conversation today? I think it's really crucial. What matters to me most, um, and one thing that I just try to live by, is I really want people to have empathy for things that they do not understand and people that they do not understand and struggles that they do not understand. Because no matter what you've personally been through, someone's always had it worse. No matter what you've seen, someone's always seen worse. And so I, I would hope that people can just learn to take a step back and try to lead a life that has a lot more empathy than apathy. And I think that um, uh, American society is naturally apathetic. And so I think that um, I'm, you know, I'm working personally to fight that because I think that people decide one day they're like, I think this and I'm done thinking any other way. And then where's the evolution in that? Right. How at, at no point do I want to be a 60 year old man who's like, well, I think this and I'm done. And this is, this is what I know. This is not, this is not real life. The world is constantly changing. So just evolve, continue to evolve as a person, allow the people in your life to evolve and love them as they are. Thank you for listening to the veterans archives podcast, where every veteran story is honored and celebrated. Join us as we explore the rich histories and experiences of those who have served our nation You can catch our podcasts on all major podcast platforms, as well as every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wreaths Across America Radio. At Veterans Archives, we believe your story matters. Visit our website at www.veteransarchives.org to discover more about our mission, access resources for veterans, and stay updated on upcoming episodes. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn to engage with our community. Subscribe, like, and share to spread awareness about our veterans' stories. Whether you're a veteran, a supporter, or simply curious about the profound journeys of those who have served, Veterans Archives invites you to listen in, learn, and be inspired. Join us as we continue to honor and preserve the legacies of our veterans. Remember, your story matters. Visit us online today at www.veteransarchives.org and connect with us on social media and stay informed and engaged. And as always, thank you for your support.